Okay, hey everybody, so we're going to take a slight divergence from the normal work dev videos here, and uh, I finally got fed up with Source Tree, so we're going to try some other stuff. Uh, the first thing we're going to try here is Git Crack, and I found it on a website that was like the top 14 Git clients, and this happened to be up there, I think, number two. So we're going to figure out how to do it. Now, I've already linked my account uh, to the software. I don't really know what that fully does, and, well, we still got to apparently set preferences and a lot of other things. Um, yeah, we're just going to go through here and just kind of pop some settings in. I mean, not too picky. So let's see, this is going to want some SSH keys. I should have a couple of these. Uh, I don't normally actually use them, to be honest. Yeah, these, well, these sort of look right. Yeah, those are set correctly. They must have pulled them from my automatic settings. Uh, git flow. Must have a repository initially, git flow, UI preferences. Uh, this all looks good. I mean, it doesn't look like we need to change any settings. Now what I need to try to get it to do is start to clone objects here. Um, I tried to drag all my folders in, that apparently didn't work. So we're going to try dragging one at a time and see if it works better that way. Nah, it apparently doesn't work with drag drop. That's unfortunate. That's one of the reasons I actually liked uh, Source Trees. I could drag drop stuff in, in here. Um, I guess we'll do a... Well, you can add an entire folder. Uh, that'll work for me. So we'll go out and we'll add my entire 174 and see if it uh, it likes it. It's looking for repositories right now. Hopefully it doesn't uh, cluster the whole thing. Uh, I might have to go through here and yeah, and it's gonna be a little fucked. Can I make subfolders? Um, can we remove things from here? Uh, it doesn't look like you can remove things. You can open the stuff. One of the main reasons I actually grabbed this uh, client up is I like the dark visual of it. That has nothing to do with my username, it's just when you have dark visuals, they're much, much easier on the eyes. By the way, prior to testing this, I did install the Git uh, plugin on here. I'm actually going to remove it real quick. Um, I don't like IntelliJ's Git plugin. One, I can't fix my repos, so several of my repos are broken, which is a reason why I'm ditching Source Tree. Uh, I thought I only corrupted ICBM and like six other repos. I fixed all those, and I'm sitting here going through, and I'm starting to update a few repositories here and trying to trying to get some stuff uh, pushed. So I go get ready to push Sentry AA and ICBM Sentries, and they're both corrupted. And I couldn't push either one of them, so I had to go reclone both of them. Uh, and then Armory started acting up, so I had to reclone it. And I think several other of these are broken as well, because when my power failed, Source Tree, for whatever reason, was writing to all of these repositories at the same time, which didn't make any sense, because nothing changed. Like, there was nothing going on. And it wasn't, I, and for people to go, like, maybe IntelliJ broke it. Well, I didn't have the Git plugins in, in installed for IntelliJ, so IntelliJ shouldn't have been messing with those either. The reality of it, I don't know what caused it, to be honest. I'm blaming Source Tree Simple for the fact that I've always had problems with Source Tree, and it's now the number one suspect, and we're going to remove it, and if the problems don't pop up, we're just going to stop using the software. Uh, anyways, I need to get rid of uh, these plugins I installed. So we're going to go Other, Configure Plugins. Uh, we want to remove git. It will automatically remove github for us. A couple of these I need to actually ditch as well. Kind of need to ditch UI designer, but I actually do use it occasionally. I'll, I'll, I'll do that later. I need to optimize my uh, IntelliJ. And is there a restart button on here? There's a power save mode, which I don't even know what it does. It's just an exit button. There's no uh, There's no restart. Be useful if IntelliJ had a restart button because it, if it asked you to restart, it'd be nice to click restart and have it shut down and turn back on for you. Um, we actually have a one nine eight nine copy of the API. I just realized that uh, it's probably no good. Uh, okay, so we want to want to go out. So this folder system's a little weird. Um, got a decent clone system, like I can go in here and I can probably clone anything. 
that's not bad. Ah, there's gotta be a better way to handle this. Okay, so let's uh, let's try opening up um, a few different projects here and see if this will handle pretty well. So we'll open up Volts Engine. Can I switch between Volts Engine and AP? Oh, I can. So I can just do that. I can switch between them real quick. Uh, it's got a bit of a slow switch to it, though. One thing S Source Tree had was at least it ran well, which is whose comment is this? That's this? Demon. Apparently, his uh, icon isn't loaded on local. It's got a nice flow. I can see my icon. It's uh, a little bit easier to read. I can see all my tags on the side, though. That's not exactly important. Uh, that's not all the tags. I think there's actually more tags than that. Uh, we had sub modules. We can make. Oh, we make pull requests right from here. Uh, I can see all my my branches here. We're actually going to get rid of everything, and I'm probably going to clone Resident Engine out to its own little repo here, and that way I can delete the branch out of that. Uh, yeah, we'll probably clean these up a bit later here. There's a lot of st work we need to do. Right now our build servers are kind of canned, uh, and I still need to fix that. So what originally I was doing is I was going through and checking all the repositories when I got up and to see what was working and what was not working. And needless to say, all my stuff's broken. Um, so I need to, let's let's open up all the normal stuff I access, and this is a bit of a tedious system. The reason I say this is um, when you design a GUI, everything should be within three clicks of, of it. And this is, I mean, one, two, I mean, you guess you're within three, but it's it's still not easy to navigate. Like it. I have to go through and scroll through this to find everything. Uh, I'm looking for prefabs. Okay, so that gets us uh, access, Volt Engine, a API, and prefabs. Uh, then we're working on Armory mod. Then we're working on, I believe, the Sentry guns. I guess ICBM would be one. Ah, man, that's just that's a little weird because you have you'd have to select, and it takes a little while to load. And then how do you commit with this? You just you go push. No, that's not good. That's not it. Push successful to Dorge and Master. Mer move merge to access system. Can I, can I rename that? Oh shit, you can. Now that that feature by itself is cool. Now how do I... How do I commit changes? I can search commits, which is nice. It's like a really cool feature, actually. Uh, I can stash. I can branch. I can pull. It'll actually give me options on that too, which is kind of nice. I can switch branches actively, which uh, I don't really care for, to be honest. Clone, reload. Uh, it's a bit of a limited system. I'm still probably going to make my own Git client here down the road because I have a certain preference on how I like to do things. And my preference happens to be uh, all the repos on the left here. <laughs> and then uh, commit message window at the bottom and then maybe some history. I actually don't even care for history. The, the fact is I rarely look through this. And when I'm looking through this, I'm more than likely to go over here to GitHub and actually look for it. Like here, I'm, I, I was testing the IntelliJ plugin. I actually got it to work. It's just, man, I'll have to read some manuals on how it's supposed to function and stuff if I ever decide to go back to it. Right now, I don't plan to, and yeah, I need to delete this repository. Hopefully that German, yeah, I think a German translation was merged in because it looks like there's a merge point there, so it looks like it's fine. I do need to get some people to update the translations here later because I don't think they're consistent. Um, let's go ahead and uh, let's load up my IntelliJ again and hopefully I fix this a couple repositories and I guess we'll get back to work here. Um, I'm trying to think what we're going to work on today. Which is basically this means that the divergence from doing work is over. We're going to go back to doing dev work now. Um, so I was doing uh, here, I went through and I changed the location of a lot of the access system here um, so it's now grouped a little better and we got a little better system here <clears throat> I'm gonna move these four things here a bit later but I'm gonna turn them into uh, an API implementation which I've started an API package up here I'm gonna get that all set up and I'm gonna probably move the API to the uh, actual API up here maybe I may leave it in the access system because the access system is eventually going to become its own mod. It's going to become uh, standalone, but will be included with Volts Engine for the download. So when you download Volts Engine, you'll get the access system. 
But what will happen is if somebody else wants to use the access system in their mod, they can download that separately or they can include it packaged in theirs. Of course, with conditional that they let Volt's Engines copy take priority. So there'll be some kind of loader in there and you'll just change the loader settings or whatever. You'll activate it in a certain order or you'll do something. More than likely how it'll end up working is that we'll implement a system where there will be a jar copy inside Volts Engine and it'll copy that jar copy out of Volts Engine into your folder and there may be some download options and uh, to be honest on Curse, because how Curse behaves, we'll just probably upload it on Curse and it'll download automatically. The beauty of Curse is that you don't have to worry about dependencies, it handles it all for you, although it doesn't actually do it perfectly, but they're working on that. We've been talking to them a couple times and they've told us they are trying to fix that issue. Uh, one of the big features we actually want from them is to be able to tell Curse exactly what version range works for a version. I would like, be like version 2.3 up is what we want to use for this this version now. Don't don't use older versions simply because they're the ones marked as beta or release. Because it'll take the most latest release version, which does not work with our latest betas and alpha versions. Because of the, uh, we don't have backwards compatibility at the moment. Eventually we do plan to have full backwards compatibility and forward compatibility on a lot of our stuff, but that's a different story. Um, so yeah, let's go ahead and uh, just load everything up and test it. I, don't, I haven't really changed much of the GUI. I think I did expanding text boxes after the last video. And uh, I think I just went through and cleaned up a few files. So there's not, not a lot has changed. And unfortunately, we've completely missed our deadline for 1A. I've been noting this in a couple videos. This wasn't going to happen. It just takes too much time to get this stuff done. And there's things that have to take priority over an update. Uh, for example, i got to get the access system up because I've got two clients now that uh, want to use it. Including, I don't know how many server owners that have been asking for the system. So it takes priority. And... Uh, once it's done and we flush a few other things out, then it will be migrating back to uh, working on getting ICBM updated to 1.8. Because how it's going to work is we'll get the ICBM cleaned up and, and removed from using Minecraft code directly. We may still end up using a, a few Forge calls just for simplicity reasons. And then I'll get Volts Engine updated to 1.8. And then if I do it right, ICBM will take maybe two or three changes to update to 1.8 after that. And that's the same for 1.9 and so on. Volt's Engine is the biggest hinging point, though, because it contains the bulk of the code for a lot of the projects, and it's going to take the bulk of the time to update, of course. So there's going to be a lot of rewriting. Um, when it comes to the transition between 1.7 and 1.8, it's mostly going to be render code. That's what that's the biggest change, is changing all the render stuff. Uh, so a lot of our prefab objects are going to have to get rewritten. Uh, there's uh, quite a few method changes. I think they went to a vector system for a lot of their method calls. Which is really going to screwball a lot of my system is I'm moving away from the vector system, they moved to it, and uh, yeah, so I'll have to f figure something out. I may end up just going back to using the vector system myself because I could just create a vector object that extends theirs and utilize it in my stuff, or I can inject a lot of my method calls into their version of the vector system so I could use their vector system like it was my own vector system, which that one seems to be the best potential one because uh, then I won't have a lot of problems. I could just utilize their stuff. And what I mean by there, I'm talking about Mojang at the moment. Although I've been talking to a few people about the possibility that they may they may be ditching uh, the Java version down the road, which would most people say would suck. It, in I, reality, I don't think it will suck at all. Yeah, so we got our node system we made yesterday, so we got our add button here. We, uh, I still haven't implemented the packet here, so we can't do anything. Like, if you click this, nothing happens. Um, oh, that's returning to the wrong GUI. Let's return us back to the group. Does this do the same thing? Yeah, those are both, uh, set up with the wrong, wrong thing on here, so we could go add. Oh, we found a bug we can fix. So that would be in the GUI, so that'd be global GUI, uh, it's not the dialogue exactly, sort of is, but not quite. Um, It kind of is. I, I, I'm realizing where the bug is stemming from. If we go in here and we add somebody again, I can show what's wrong. Okay, so when we, we've we added somebody, we're in here, we hit remove. We have now transitioned 
to the this being our center frame. So you see the group frame disappeared behind it. Of course, this needs to be re resized and stuff. It's actually the wrong size. Uh, and then when we hit yes, it takes us back to the group frame because that's what the current center frame actually is. So the entire frame here was replaced. Uh, we have a few options to fix this. I can change how this, that yes no dialog behaves, which is the best option at the moment. Or I could tell the group frame to cache the current object it's in, which is not a horrible idea. Yeah, that one would look better at least. Yeah, well, we'll do that way. So we'll get the uh, we'll get the group frame to just remember what it's currently looking at. Uh, show remove group frame. Okay, this is a this is a prefab apparently. I'm sitting here staring at a prefab thinking it's the main frame. Uh, I need to rename my objects. Okay, so there's our group array. So this is our main dialog. And what we have is somewhere it's not the group entry, it's actually one of the edit things. Uh, we'll look at node entry, because that's probably where it's at. Now here we go. We got yes no dialog. We set the parent, and we load center frame. Uh, what we actually want to do is tell this to return. And I actually just need to make a callback object for this. Yeah, so we'll go ahead and close Minecraft, and I'm going to make a system for this, because I, the yes-no dialog needs to be told where to return to instead of trying to return to uh, a set spot every single time. Um, so what we got is when you... No, actually, it's already set up this way. This is, where I'm, this is where I'm looking for. Okay, so what we need is we're in node entry. We need to get the group frame, which we should already have. We do not actually have a reference to the group frame. Um, we need to fix that. Uh, actually, we don't need a reference to the group frame. What we need is a reference to uh, GUI cent or frame center. I did this already for a different GUI. So the uh, I think the user GUI may already have this set up into it. I'm not sure where the node one is because I thought I copied and pasted these two, but. Uh, Maybe I wasn't paying attention fully. Yeah, if we go, we go to the user entry. Yeah, it doesn't have it either. So we'll go ahead and we'll add it to this one as well. It's just a little bit of extra work to get this to function. Okay. So now that means we have to go to each one of these and we're going to have to pass back the center frame, uh, this does have its parent object. So what we could do is go gy dot get parent object. I think this will work. Actually, you know what? I think there's a better way to do this. I think the that GUI actually has access to the center frame. No. Okay, let's take a look at these. It's got a parent object actually stored in it. Okay, so if we go to the parent here, we actually do have a frame center, so this we just need to make this public because it's actually stored. So we go here, frame center. Cool. That'll work there, and if we go over here, we can should be able to do the same exact things. Yeah, this stores its GUI as well, so we should we go to GUI dot frame center. In reality, what we could do is we can just pass this GUI down in there. That's actually an option. Uh, we may switch to that here later if we need to. Right now, we're just going to use the frame center. It should get us uh, what we need. Um, so this is set, and then what we want to do is we want to transition. 
transition our object. So we want to go frame center dot group frame dot show and then yes no dialog. I think is what we're doing. Apparently not. Let me take a look at frame center. Okay, that's what yeah, we wanna hit call show on frame center. Yeah, here we go. So that will work. And then when the back button is called, what we want to do is we want to call and return to whatever our previous object was. Um, this is where we actually do need uh, we do actually need the object we're, we're using. So this would be GUI uh, group group frame users. And we'll change this out. And what we can do is go frame center dot frame center. And then do the same thing here, except instead of this being yes no, we're calling frame center. And this will need to be renamed, of course, to uh, frame users. Actually, I'm going to rename that again. Change it to users frame. It always goes your name of your object, then your type, kind of. So you go like yes, no, then dialog. It's users, then frame. Remove user, then button. It's, it's a good methodology to keep, because you're going, okay, what are we, and then what what is our, our type? Rather than going type and then something else. Although you can do it the other way, so you can call it button, like two, button three, button something like that. It works, as long as you just keep consistent, it's fine. Uh, so this will fix that. Of course, we need to go up to... Well, we need to do this object too. So this would be GUI frame group nodes. This is where I was also talking about I really do need to make a prefab for this because a, a prefab would be perfect. Because we could set using generics, we can tell what our type is. And we could do a few other things, but uh, I need to get to that later because that's something I need to sit down and actually take a look at of how we can prefab that better. Although these are pretty much identical in how they function. We also need to set the relative size of this and relative positioning. Um, so what we could do is this will be zero zero. This will be yes no dialog dot set relative position. It would be new GUI relative pause, and you just pass in zero zero. Actually, no, it's not zero zero. It'll be uh, nodes frame dot frame center dot yeah get relative. Well, not get relative position. There actually is one for this. Center frame pause right there. That'll make sure it stays in that same exact spot as every other component subcomponent we have, uh, and it'll work perfectly fine. And then yeah, we don't need to set its parent because its parent actually be no. Actually, we do want to set its parent because right? that's how we get our call back to this. No, yeah, it's actually going to be problematic. Um, sort of. We just need to actually switch this to this. Because uh, the very act of calling show is going to set its parent to uh, the center frame, because it calls add, and then add sets the parent. So we want to change the parent again, because we want to make sure that our node entry is the one who's getting the calls, not uh, the parent object. Anyways, we come down here, and we want to go, okay, nodes frame dot frame center dot show and then we would call notes frame. So we make sure we're resetting frame back and then uh, we don't need a set parent on this one. We just need to it'll it'll die off. That object will disappear. Uh, so we're good there. We're good. We just have to go to each one of these and we need to change it to just pass in GUI. Just what we should have done the first time. But it's like, eh, I've got that mentality where you're trying to pass in the least amount of data to an object. Because you don't want to pass in too much data. Because then you're just kind of wasting memory. And we do the same thing here. And we need to come over to this object. Uh, we want to set the relative size to, but we'll get to that in a second. Everything else sort of looks good. 
Uh, it doesn't look like we have to really do much else. We just got to get that size down. Um, trying to think of how to do the size. I, I really need to make an object uh, or shared object for the size at this point because I think we're recycling it repeatedly. Uh, let me look at group entry because that's where we're actually creating the relative size here. Uh, apparently it's working. Whatever, copy that. that, that if, that's, uh, if that's how it's, it's working, and then we could just do this really quick and we don't have to do that later, because then we just go pretty much user's frame. Because what, what we're doing, I guess we're telling it to match the group frame at all times, which is not a horrible idea, I guess. A good thing I was I did it that way. So that saves us a lot of time, because anytime we change the group frame size, it automatically changes everybody else's size. Uh, although that might come back to bite us later if we decide to uh, make some of these GUIs not the same size. But, we can hit that up at another time. So what we want to do is this one's node frame. There we go. And we'll launch and see if that fixes our, our positioning. And we'll see if uh, this is actually caught up on the changes we're doing. So if we go to axis group. Oh, we got unstaged files. Uh, how do we stage them? Stage all changes. I kind of would wish this was inverted. Because it feels weird to have stuff drop down. The summary description. Uh, well, fixed. Yes, no dialogue. It's been a while since I've actually had to uh, commit descriptions. Uh, if you use the Git for Windows, it actually has that, but uh, Source Tree doesn't have that. There's no description system. It's just simply you you can you can name the commit and that's it, which is all you need. But it's really cool to have these extra notes. Uh, so change destination dialog in uh, nodes in user group subframes to return back to subframe rather. Okay, and we'll, we're not going to commit this yet. We're just going to test everything and make sure it's working, and then I'll commit it. But that's that's actually not too bad. I can I can get used to this as long as it doesn't kill my uh, repositories like Source Tree. I'll I'll get over the fact that I lost my hierarchy folders. So that's the one thing I do love about Source Trees. I had that huge hierarchy folder on the side, although it never really worked well, but it was still much much better than any other system I've ever had. Okay, so what we want to do is we're going to come in here. I don't remember re-adding Creeper, do you guys? I'm pretty sure we deleted it. Oh, look, that's pretty nice. Correct size, correct positioning. We return to the correct GUI. Anyways, I'm going to reload this real quick, so I want to make sure that hostile group got changed. Yeah, it got changed. Okay. And, uh, yeah, we're good. So it's, it's a node one is the last one that we need to change. So we're going to add a, no a random node here. Oh, that's right, we can't actually add a random node. We can test this, though. It does return to the correct place. There we go, that's fixed up. So we can just uh, hit commit. And I believe I have to put push as well. Push successful. I like those little notifications there. They're a little, they're in the way, though. Uh, they, they come over top of this, which I would rather it be like somewhere down here or out of the way so it's not covering up uh, this over here because I believe you have to click something up here to stage and unstage stuff. Uh, that's good. Yeah, it looks nice. That's, a, that's a local. Confirms with master. So far, so good. I wonder if I can merge pull request from here. Like if somebody did a pull request online and it would show up in here or notify. Do, we, do I get a... I don't think I get a, a little corner notification system. Okay. 
that's one thing uh, the Git client I plan to make. Uh, its main purpose of being created is actually not to be a Git client. It's meant to be a notification system. And what I want to do is I want to implement it for the this overlay here, which shouldn't be pitch black, by the way. Uh, Windows is working on me really hard. I had another power failure last night, although this wasn't due to the break or the whole power in the, the town I was in failed for uh, about 20 minutes. Uh, I slept through it, though. I got woken up by the stuff turning on, which is weird considering the backup power supply, which is my computer's plugged in, is uh, not exactly quiet. It's loud. But yeah, one of the things I want to do is, uh, so we got like a Twitter here. Um, I actually almost never use this Twitter client anymore because it crashes a lot. But it comes with some notifications here, says the weather. But I want to put a Git client here that would go, okay, you have like 15 un un uncommitted changes and you have a whole bunch of changes to pull and you could just hit pull all or something from here. And it'll also give you notifications down the corner. So you go like, hey, somebody just pushed one of your repositories. Do you want to pull now? And it'd be a nice way to keep synchronized because after all, Git is actually not just supposed to be used as a source control system. Um, when you're using GitHub, it's actually meant to be a social interaction system too. So having a notification system for it would actually be really, really useful. I haven't seen an application like it. I know there probably is one out there though. Um, anyways, what do we want to work on next? Uh, we can change the, the width of these. Uh, probably not. Those buttons right where they're at are actually pretty good. We could do the every other colors, but eh, that's not exactly important. Let's do the settings here. Let's get that out of the way. So I'm going to go ahead and close Windows for that. And I'll fix the yes-no dialog. See, somebody may go like, why don't you just fix the yes-no dialog uh, string length? Uh, that's, I got to go fix that in this. And I got to do, uh, when it goes to do the render on the string, I got to come up with a way to split the string properly. And I mentioned that before. is something I don't really care to work with right now. So we'll just leave that alone because it's not too big of an issue. Um, and what we actually could do is, uh, if we do that right there, we go remove node from this, we shorten the string up right there and that'll fix it off the back and we'll do the same thing over here. Because it doesn't really change the questions, it does make the questions sound more primitive where you go, okay, do you want to? So it acts like it's optional. This one goes remove user from this, which sounds more robotic. Um, just kind of wording issues. You don't see a lot of people give thought to that, but it actually doesn't matter to pick your wording correctly on GUIs because it does affect users. The What you have there and what you're displaying actually doesn't matter. Um, for example, if we, hold on, let me uh, just bring it in here. You guys can deal with the scoping thing. Take, for example, this mic auxiliary on uh, OBS. Uh, I wish that would tell you that this is your primary mic auxiliary system and that the bar is showing you your current volume level. Same down here. It's a little bit more text that you add to the system, but it adds a wealth of information. A lot of this other stuff's the same way. Like we got scenes here, what are scenes, what are sources? You have to go read the documentation for this. When you design an application, you want the application to explain itself with almost no documentation. That's not to say clutter your screen with text because you don't want to do that either, but you do want to make things much, much easier to understand and interpret. Um, a lot of applications are bad at that. Uh, one good thing I know is about source trees, it actually will show icons over the folders here. So something I plan to utilize in a few of the applications I'm making myself where I will have icons similar, not exactly the same because of course I can't copy their stuff. But knowing that something's a folder is really, really nice versus a class. So we have a C for class. We got folder with a blue icon saying that that contains source code. We go, okay, this is our primary source code folder. And it will even tell me my hierarchy, like we're in the access folder, we're in source main, and it goes all the way through. And you see the same thing over here. It'll also tell you if the folders are locked. Like I think I can lock class files and prevent them from being editing, which is actually something pretty cool. It'll also, uh, I don't know what the caret does. I think it's because you have nested classes or it's static. Yeah, it's, I think it's because it's final is how that works. Um, so what we want to do is we want to actually work on the settings GUI. So this will be under edit. Um, yeah, that's fine. I was about to say, like, I need to kind of, I do need to rename this. This would be G, this would be GUI frame apps group, uh, this would be GUI subframe group is that way I'm not opening it by accident. Cause that, that, that works. Um, I'm not going to rename those guys because those are going to rename incorrectly, but those are subframes, but eh. And what we'll do is we'll go, okay, uh, one, we'll put abstract on this. Uh, prefab for any frame that is a subframe for the group system. 
I believe the actual main frame actually does use that, so I'll have to remember, make sure. No, we're, we're, we're an access frame. A little weird when you think about it, because... Oh, no, wait, this makes sense. Because this is actually... Should be under profiles where this should actually be under. It should be under main down here, but it's it's in, it's in there, whatever. I'll deal with it. I don't want to be th throwing a whole bunch of class files around and moving stuff and spending a whole bunch of time moving things. Okay, so we want to do a text box. So we're going to want to come down and... Let's open this one up, and we're going to copy some of the code from here. So... We want an add button and we want that, except this is actually going to be a save button. Or more of a commit button, actually, is what it's going to be. You like commit to the object. Uh, copy. Actually, you know, we don't need update positions anymore. That's actually handled for us. But uh, I'm going to leave it on that one. I'm just going to get rid of it on the next one. So we'll copy these. We're going to bring this down. I still need to make my string render component, which I haven't done yet. So we're still going to manually render those. Uh, name filled, and we'll rename this to save button. I think this works. At least it should. We don't want to hug bottom with this though, so... Yeah, these are both hug bottom. These need to be... GY hug... or uh, hug X, I believe is what they're called. Uh, so let me open this up. So yeah, we do want to hug left. This will be hug x side. Uh, that should work. Because we want this to hug the right, we want this to hug the left, because this is going to be on the left side, this is going to be the right side of the component. Uh, then we need a y level. So we can go int uh, y equals, say, 30 is a good spot to start with. And then we want to set our y offset to the y value. That way, these auto auto hug properly. Uh, we do want our relative size here to increase. Um, so what we're doing is saying, okay, the size of our node field is going to be the width minus the amount of space that button needs, plus spacing to prevent the two from kind of overlapping. Uh, I did this for the user in the node field. I didn't show it, of course, but it is really useful because it means that if our GUI gets really, 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 really big, our text field expands to the same width, allowing that person who has a bigger monitor to experience a better usability because his text field is now wider, allowing him to see more of the text string. Um, unfortunately, we don't have handling for small monitors at the moment, but this will auto scale. What I'm thinking about small monitors is stuff like this down here. Like if your monitor got too small, this stuff could actually start to render weird. Luckily, Minecraft does scale things up and down automatically, but you do get weird side effects with uh, different aspect ratios, and GYs are not always going to handle all the aspect ratios equivalently. This is the one of the downsides of having a full screen GUI is that you now have to keep in mind aspect ratios more than a normal container uh, GUI, which is what most people use. Uh, the normal container GUIs auto scale pretty well, and they're almost always going to be the same size. A full screen GUI is not going to be the same size and will change with your aspect ratio. We saw this uh, in a couple of last videos where when I was changing the aspect ratio, one of my center components was not changing size with it, and it actually was starting to overlap. This is actually a big, pretty big problem, but um, we don't need this anymore. We do need our label. So this is our label. Uh, it's right now 15 down. We want uh, this to be 30. And we should be good. So we'll get uh, parent settings here. I don't know what other settings we're going to have on groups at the moment. Uh, I know we're going to have a hidden setting. Might have can inherit, so you, you can prevent a group from being inherited by another group. That one I don't see a lot of edge cases for at the moment. Uh, I can think of a few other settings here later, but right now the only one we really need is to change the hierarchy, and then we're done. We, at that point, all we need to do is make sure you can make groups, 
and you can fully use the permission system to its, uh, to its extent to make sure that you have a nice hierarchy system. After that, it's just implementing all the permission nodes checks. Uh, I already know how we're going to implement uh, a lot of the checks on machines. We're going to use the listener system, which is I've showed in a couple videos uh, us working with. So we're going to have a, a listener for permission, and it'll interact and it'll do your on right clicking on machines, your open inventory, your add stuff to inventory slots. Although keep in mind, somebody who does have a cheated client can bypass the permission system for the inventory containers. There's nothing I can do about that. I can try to make it as usable as possible, but it has there's a synchronization system that works between the client server that's handled entirely by Minecraft, and I would have to put myself between that in order to prevent people from sticking stuff in, in GUIs. The best way to prevent this from working is just on the server, prevent the container from opening in the first place, which is what we're going to do anyways. But if some reason you got the container open and you had, and you had set... Actually, the best case example, if you set users that could open up your container to say, look at your settings and look at what's in the inventory, but could not access the inventory, somebody could make a hacked client, then they could get access to the inventory. And this is not just my mod this would be a problem with. Uh, any mod that has that kind of permission behavior to it can be bypassed this way. Uh, just to be warned, if you're a server owner and start to get all paranoid about this, it, it is something that actually can be done. But don't worry about it. Most users aren't going to do it. And if a hack client ever gets distributed for my mods, I will go out of my way to make sure that hack client no longer functions. And it would be the simplest thing in the world would just be go detect mod that's interfering with my code. Or add a security manager would be the best way too. Uh, I can start adding uh, sanity checks to my code that go, okay, the signature on this file is no longer valid, therefore somebody's messed with our stuff. Um, and I could inform the server of that, and then I could let you as a server owner decide if you want to let, allow that person to continue playing or not. You can just kick them straight off the back I, and set up an automated kick system. Uh, just don't take that too far as somebody could have something really simple as they want to have a hotkey to open one of my GUIs. So do ask the user what he has, and then do take an investigation look at it. Anyways, we so we worked on the settings here. Okay, so we do actually have a uh, system here. Um, so this is our label, which is double rendering for whatever reason. I gotta figure out why we're double rendering. That is something that has to be fixed here. So what we do is we got a super do render. Our super do render renders all of our subcomponents, and we go all the way up. It just does nothing. Okay. So that's not what's causing us to double render. So we get our axis group, we get our system here, and. We render our stuff. I'm going to put a break line here. I want to see what's calling this. Okay, so we got our access system here, which does all of its work. Then it calls super draw. Super draw then goes through and draws all of our buttons, which is what we want to have, have do. We have a label list? What is this? You're new. I don't know what you are, but you're cool. Uh, there is a label system in Minecraft. I never knew this. Okay, so we then draw the button, which goes through, does update. It does. This is our debug render code, which you don't need to worry about. We have a draw background. Uh, then we call do render. Then we call mouse drag, of course, at the end of that, because. All of our update code for our stuff is done through the render section, which is kind of dumb, but it works. Uh, then we loop through our subcomponents, and then we draw stuff in our container, which then finds our container object, which then does its whole do render system, of course, again. We get our subframe render, which is where we're at. Okay, okay, so. Oh, okay, we call do render here, which then calls do render with access group. Okay, I, I was, my brain just wasn't quite catching up with that. Which then calls super to that. So, it is a linear path. Does explain why we're double rendering, though. You see, we were. Unless that's the shadow. Could that be the shadow messing up? 
yeah, that's actually the shadow messing up. Here, here I've been thinking it's a double render. It's not. It's uh, it's the render code being broken. Um, so how we fix this is we got to reset the color. I need to go see where to find this because I, my brain just doesn't want to remember what the color call is. I knew I knew it was GL11, but I couldn't remember what the rest of it was. I'm not as sleep deprived as I normally am, but I'm still working through the whole getting up at six in the morning and doing stuff type of thing. Eventually I'll get used to it though. Okay, so if we reset that, that doesn't seem to uh, help any. Because what it should is it should render like this, but it's not. We are calling default string color, but it is getting a gray shade for some reason. Um, I don't think it's because we're the way we're drawing it, but we are getting an effect. It, it could be because of blending effects. We could turn off blend right before we call draw string, but I think draw string already does all this for us. So you get draw string with shadow, draw string, which enables alpha, reset styles, reset styles. Okay, apparently I didn't know there was under there's underscore italic rin. Wow, that's cool. Uh, so we render string, so if we actually, yeah, render with shadow, it comes through, it gets our collar, sets our collar, which, the dumbest thing ever is we're passing an integer and then it converts it from an integer back into the individual float values anyways, so I'm kind of like, why don't we just pass in the collar directly? Uh, I may actually make a render method for this to do this later. Render string at pause. There's something weird going on there. Uh, wow. I don't know what that is, but uh, we'll, I'm going to have to come back and investigate later. I'm not seeing any color resets in here, so this is just a straight out text reset, so this should work. We're not getting a reload on that, so let's reopen up and see if that makes a difference. We're still getting that double render. I am resetting the collar right before we're calling this. At least I think I am. And my dog's gonna bark at me. Oh, come on, Taz. Not today. Let's try resetting it here. Or maybe that'll fix the sub call here. No, we're not getting that either. Uh. Okay, let's go up the uh, call chain real quick. And let's take a look at how we're doing our super calls. Okay, I'm going to reset the caller after each loop here. That isn't making a difference here. So I'm going to leave that there though because that actually is kind of important. Okay, so when we call it, we draw our background. Uh, we are resetting the color here. So the color is reset before we do anything. Um, we are unfortunately binding a texture before we're, we're actually calling everything, which might be the problem. But we're, we're getting the correct stylation, so I don't think that's it. And it shouldn't matter because it should bind the correct texture. Or should it? Okay, so we're rendering this out in the access system real quick. So I'm going to go... Actually, you know what? Wait, let me type in here real quick. Okay, so we're getting a perfect render here. Let's go take a look at how the text boxes are doing the render system. So we have a, we have a text box. And let's see how it's rendered. Taz, no, go behave. Just just for the record, she's been light outside and fed, so she's whining at me solely because she knows I'm working. Hey, no. Okay. Uh, oh, we disable lighting, we disable blending. You know what? 
uh, I'm going to go ahead and end the video here, and I will be back. And in the next video, we're going to we're going to make a render object for our text because we need to do this in order to fix it. I I thought potentially the blending could be the problem, and I think it is. So if we if we get rid of both of these, it should fix itself. Anyways, that'll be the next video.